Welcome to Life Church. I'm so glad that you joined with us. We really pray that this message today will make a difference in your world. Acts 17, verse 28 says, For in him, everybody say, in him. In him we live and move. Everybody say, move. 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 For in him we live and move and have our being. For in him we live and move and have our being. Just a short verse that I want to kick this off with today before we go a little bit deeper. I want to speak about what it is to move. What it is to move. You know, moving, the life that we live and the moving that we have within our life is all part of our being. In Acts it says, for in him we live and we move. It is part of our being. You see, movement in God is an exercise of your freedom. The reality is that you could wake up this morning, you made a decision to come to church here today because there is a freedom which enables you to move from where you are in your house to this place. But there are many people around the world who don't have the same freedom. And so they are restricted in their movement. But you guys, we have that opportunity. It is an exercise of your freedom. A few weeks ago, I was moving a bouncy castle. <laughs> Just don't do it. It's the heaviest thing in the world. And I was moving a bouncy castle out of a van for my son's birthday party. Hire a bouncy castle. <laughs> Let other people do the job. And I pulled it out and I just felt something in my back like go. And it's a sign of <laughs> getting 28. <laughs> Can I say it's great to have all our Wildfire and Vox crew in church today. How many of you love the young people in this church? It's good to have you here. Now move this bouncy castle. And it wasn't a drastic sudden pain, but I definitely noticed something. And over the next few days... Pain began to enter into my back, and I've never had back pain. I've never been one of those people who like sometimes struggle with back pain. I've, I've never, it's never been an issue for me. But what I found was the more I moved, the freer I became. That in fact, if I kept moving, and in fact, if I ran, I felt better than when I stopped. That the more I continually moved, the freer my back became. But the moment I stopped was the moment I seized. The moment I stopped, the moment my back began to seize up. And much of the seizing in our destinies is a result, I believe, of a lack of movement. Sometimes our destinies just seize up. It's still there. It still exists. My back is still there. My back still has a function. My back still has a mobility, but it's just seized up. And some of you in church today, your destiny is still there. Your destiny is still full of potential. Your destiny still has plenty of mobility within it. But for some of you, it just feels like it has seized up a little bit. And my aim today, if you ask me what is my, my aim, it is to, is to rub... <laughs> It is to rub some, some I believe. Oh, sorry, I, I just had to do that. I, I just had to do that. <laughs> to rub some I believe into, say it again. <laughs> to rub some belief into your destinies. That where there are aspects of your life which is seized up, Still there, but it's seized up. Aspects maybe within church, maybe within a ministry that you serve in, somewhere within your home, that there is just begin to be a bit of seizing, to rub some belief into that and to speak to the potential energy that is within your future that you need to know is stored up in abundance in you. There is incredible potential energy in every single one of you that is not stored up in limitations, it is stored up in abundance. There is an overflow of potential within every single individual here today. And some of you, I think, feel like you are stuck in the mud. <laughs> I used to play that when I was at school. I'm not sure if you still play that. If you don't, play it 
Tuesday morning at school, you become like a hero, stuck in the mud. And, and it's like TIG, but you, as soon as you got stuck, you had to s- stop and stand still. And the only way to become free again was for someone to run under your legs. And then once they run under your legs, you're free again. And, and my aim today is to help uh, is, is to run under some of our legs and get us moving again and to understand that there is an abundance within you because the truth is we all get stuck sometimes. All of us seize up. All of us get stuck sometimes. I can get stuck in fear and the fear holds me, it grips me and it keeps me in a certain place. I can get stuck in doubt, where I just live and I'm just stuck in a place of doubt. I can get stuck in poverty, and I just seize up in poverty, and I don't see any movement coming from it, but I've just seized up within poverty. I I can get stuck in sickness, where I just feel like I'm consistently always stuck in this place of sickness. I can get stuck in the mundaneness of life. I can get stuck in the past. But wherever you are stuck, you need to know it is not God's will for you to stay there. I honestly believe it is not God's will for you to stay stuck in sickness, for you to stay stuck in poverty, for you to stay stuck in a mundaneness of a boring life and boring routine that you perceive to be boring. I do not believe it is God's will for you to stay stuck in a past situation or a past circumstance. That is not your destination. Your destination is heaven. Amen. And earth is a whole lot of movement till you get there. (laughs) That's what earth is. It's a whole lot of movement from place to place. Place to place. And the moment we sort of settle and get stuck is often the moment we can seize up. But yet life consists of being and moving. Movement in your spirit. Movement in your soul. Movement in your thinking. Movement in your perspective. Movement in your dreams. And I know some of you have moved here. But this is not necessarily about a physical move. But it is about an internal move that says things are going to shift. Things are going to stop becoming seized where they have been seized. Don't stay stuck in a 1983 dream. When maybe God wants to do a new thing. When God calls Abraham 75, God moves him. God moves him at at that age and says, go, I'm sending you somewhere. You don't necessarily know where you're going. That's not important. What is important right now is that you move from where you are. The first step of getting somewhere is your ability to move. And movement, let me tell you, does not stop in your 30s. According to Jesus, that was when he got going. (laughs) Movement doesn't stop in your 30s. It continues into your 40s, to your 50s, into your 60s. Last night I had the pleasure of watching Anthony Joshua versus Vladimir Klitschko, the heavyweight championship of the world. That's like my dream to be in the ring and do that thing, you know, where they, in the red corner. <laughs> this is awesome. I like goosebumps. I'm like, come on, Lim. <laughs> but I was watching it, and 41 year old Vladimir Kilichko, been a legend for decades, fighting against this new up and coming champion, 28. <laughs> okay. 28, considered a youngster when it comes to boxing. And in the sixth round, I encourage you to watch it illegally somewhere online. It says, <laughs> the, sixth, the sixth round, they have said, is one of the greatest rounds of boxing of all time. Of all time. At the beginning of the round, um, at the beginning of the round, Klitschko got, Klitschko got knocked down. Okay? Knocked down. He was dazed. Okay? So at the end of the round, Klitschko knocks Joshua down. And from then on, for the next four rounds, Klitschko was winning the fight. They said from round one to around round 10, Klitschko was winning the fight. And do you know why they said he was winning the fight? Because he was moving. And they said, Anthony Joshua cannot cope with Klitschko's movement. His movement 
was what enabled him to get to that point. But ultimately, it was youth and the strength of Joshua which prevailed. As I was watching it last night, I was thinking, please, Klitschko, win. Please, Klitschko, win. This is really going to help my illustration in the morning. Please, God, God, come on, God. Oh, no. Okay, how can we twist this around and make it? <laughs> Movement is so powerful, so effective. And you can be a 41-year-old, so-called has-been, but still have the ability to take on a 28-year-old in his prime because of the movement that exists within an individual. This is not an age thing today. You can be young and stuck, and you can be old and full of movement. The aim is to get movement in every single one of us, and we wake up. We wake up every morning, we go morning by morning, new mercies I see, bring it on, I'm ready for it. Because much of the establishment of God's people on earth in the Old Testament is all about movement. It is about God moving his people from one place to another. The more you read through the Old Testament, it's, it's often just about, it's about the formation of territory. It's about God taking his people in a certain place, in a certain direction, moving them from place to place. God is leading his people from somewhere to somewhere else. From to, from to, where God has taken me from to where God is taking me to. The place that I leave and the place that I go. And what you begin to realize is movement is a vital part of our function as a people. It is a vital part of our function as a church. That is why as a church, we can never get stuck and seize. We have to keep moving. We might not always know the exact destination. We might not always know what everything is going to look like. But we have to move. We have to change certain things. We have to invest and we have to create and we have to make new things. And we have to, people's roles will change. And, and, and things within the church will change. And cultural aspects will change. That is all part of God's master plan. It is movement. The Bible says in the book of Acts that God, Jesus, commands his disciples and he says, hey, go and, go and be my disciples and, and go and do it everywhere. And start off in Jerusalem and then move to Judea and then move to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And right now we are the result of people's physical movement out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. It is all about the movement. And sometimes we want to stay in Judea but God says, keep moving to Samaria. And in the book of Exodus, we find this mass movement of people from a place of slavery to a place of freedom. It is really a picture of salvation is this Exodus that we know that Moses led out of Egypt into the promised land. A picture of the salvation that we experience now in the, in the New Testament because salvation is a move from slavery to freedom. Salvation is a move from the place of death to a place of life. Salvation is a movement from a place of darkness to a place of light. And you cannot receive salvation over there, but stay rooted in slavery and death over here. Salvation is the place you leave to go to the place you go to. It's why at every service, and we'll do it at the end of this service, an opportunity for people to respond to Jesus and to say yes to Jesus because we believe it is receiving salvation where your life goes from here to there. Where there is a movement in your soul and there is a movement in your spirit. And in Exodus chapter 14, we meet Moses and the Israelites. And we meet them at this intersection. We meet them at this place, they are close to where they're at the Red, they're at the Red Sea where they need to cross. And they're at this point and this intersection of life where they really have an opportunity to go forwards, to go backwards, to go left, or to go right. And what I've realized more and more about life is that life gives you intersections. Life takes you to certain places on your journey 
where you have decisions on where you go. You have decisions on where you move. And these intersections are crucial because the movement that we make and the direction that we take is crucial to the places that we will go. Now, you don't have major intersections in your life every week. In your life, I would imagine there might be four or five major intersections that you have in your life. Major intersections. Intersections that Moses is facing right here with the Israelites. And what I want to encourage every single one of you, when you come to one of those major intersections, choose well. Choose wisely. Go to God. Ask him, God, what is that your plan? Talk to great people because those intersections are crucial to the places where you go. And in Exodus 14, I'm going to read from verse 5. I'm going to read for the next few verses. It says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? Moses has led the Israelites out of Egypt the plagues have happened and Pharaoh's got to a point where he says, go, just go, get out of here. And so now Moses is leading his people and now Pharaoh is changing his mind and he's thinking, what have I done? We have let the Israelites go and we have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers, all, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Piharioth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached the Israelite, the, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. But Moses answered the people and he said, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will never, you will never see again for the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And I'm reading that thinking, well, to be still, but I'm, I'm, we're, we're talking about movement <laughs> and you're saying we need to be still. God, I'm a, I'm a little bit confused here, but Moses is in fact teaching the Israelites, his people, not in fact to stand still, not for them just to be no movement within them, but to develop quickly, because <laughs> Pharaoh's coming, to develop this confidence and this assurance that God has got this, that God has got this, that you will not fail me, that you have got this. In fact, another translation doesn't say be still. Another translation says Moses said, hold your peace. Hold your peace. Because what's about, to gonna hap what's about to happen and where we're about to go is going to require you to hold your peace. The message version doesn't put it as politely. The message version says, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> That's how Eugene H. Peterson, the legend, puts it. Moses turns to the Israelites and says, keep your mouth shut, we're moving. Keep your mouth shut, we're about to move somewhere. <laughs> and Moses is saying, what is required of you right now as we are at this intersection, as the Red Sea is in front of us and as Pharaoh is behind us, you've got to delve into your reserves. In verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, look at this, when the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Look at that. Tell the Israelites to move on. God is saying to Moses, move on. Stop crying out to me now. Move on. We don't need more prayer now, Moses. Move on. We don't need another service right now, Moses. Move on. I know you're great at these inspirational messages and stuff, but we simply need you now to 
move on. And it struck me when I read this, how many times have I looked back at my Pharaoh and God says, move on. How many times have I looked back there and I see Pharaoh coming and God says, move on. Don't allow Pharaoh to catch hold of your promise. Don't allow the Pharaoh, which is back there, to catch hold of the promise of God that is on your life. Because if you do not move, the enemy has a way of catching up with you. If you stay still, if you simply live seized, seized in destiny, seized in how I think, seized in how I live, seized in how I talk. I just stop here. It won't be long before Pharaoh catches up with you. And when Pharaoh catches up with you, he will not be nice. Pharaoh will take you back to the place you once were. But you see, God has delivered you from there, but he is now calling you to what? Move on. To move on. And I felt today... I felt today God wanted to say to some of us, move on, move on. That there's no need to keep crying out to God. Crying out to God it, it, it is great. Crying out to God is awesome, but sometimes God says, I don't need you to cry out to me anymore. I need you to move on. I, I, I know it's great that you want to do that, but move on. You don't need another prayer line, you need to move on. You don't need another conversation. You need to move on. You know, this hit sort of some personal, practical, small life <laughs> reality. Let's bring it down to the basement. A few months ago, when I was looking at uh, changing the mortgage that I've had, which I've had for like five or six years now, and I went to the bank to discuss my new mortgage. And uh, just to get a better rate, I was thinking, I've not done it for a long time. Maybe I should just do that. And by the way, do that. <laughs> okay. So I went to meet with them, and they gave me this new rate. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. I'm like, it's like half the price of what I'm paying, and yet we'll pay it down quicker. I'm like, hmm. And then, and then she said, um, what you might want to know is if you could have done this five years ago. So basically what she's saying to me is I've been overpaying <laughs> <laughs> for five years I've been overpaying hundreds of pounds a month <laughs> God is a good God yes he is for five years now at the time I came out now firstly I'm, firstly I was with abs <laughs> And Abs is much quicker to move on than I am. I came out and I was just thumping. And it must have been like days, weeks, where I'm thinking, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money. And I honestly felt something in my spirit where God just went, Dave, move on. Move on. Number one, be grateful that you have a house to live in in the first place. Number two, be grateful that you're in a place where you can even get a mortgage because there are lots of people who can't even afford a mortgage. And number three, be grateful now that what you've lost, you're now going to repay and you're now going to save every month as a result of the decision you've made. Draw a line. Move on. Pharaoh's coming. I'm on my way. And that was such a personal thing. Because otherwise, I don't appreciate my new rate and I live in my old place. I don't appreciate the fact that now I don't have Egyptians whipping me, telling me to make more stuff. I, I need to appreciate, at least, I, at, least I'm, at least I'm able to talk how I want to talk. At least I'm able to have a drink when I want to have a drink. Like, I, I, I know, I, I, yeah, but, 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 but no, move on. Move on, because what you now have, you might have taken longer than what you should have done, but you move on because where you are now is better than the place that you were. You've got to move on because only when you move on can God then drown the enemy. Because God needed Moses and the Israelites to move on because as they moved on through the Red Sea and they passed it, 
Then Pharaoh comes. God is able then to bring the waves in and drown the enemy. You move from one place to another place. God can do the breakthrough. God can part the Red Sea, but he expects you to move through it. God can heal blind Bartimaeus' eyes, but he expects blind Bartimaeus to get up and to go and to move on as a result of his healing. God can, God can forgive and God can restore the woman who is caught in adultery, but he expects her to go now and leave your life of sin. He expects all of the people that he does breakthrough and miracle and stuff with, he always says, go, move, get on with your life. Go from one place to the next place. Sometimes we want to party in the miracle, but the purpose of the miracle is to move on to what's next. If you've been healed of a bad leg and you've been struggling with it, it's not simply just a party in the miracle. That's great, and you can have a miracle party. <laughs> but the purpose of that now is for you to use your leg <laughs> to walk with freedom, to run, to cycle in the Tour de Yorkshire, to get in the ring with Vladimir Klitschko. It is to do something as a result of the breakthrough. Because what was in Israel was greater than what was in Egypt. The potential that was there in Israel, but it needed this kinetic energy to receive it. You are stored up with potential energy, but it has to transfer to some form of kinetic energy for you to go. The Bible says, he that is in you, is greater than he that is in the world. And God can drive the Pharaoh out of you when you commit to move with him. And this 14-day journey, people, scholars think it should have taken a couple of weeks, maybe a little bit longer with all of their stuff and all of the kids and everyone. <laughs> How many of you know taking families with you takes a while? But this should have taken a couple of weeks, this journey from Egypt to Canaan, people sometimes argue on that. Let's not argue it for this sake. It should have taken a lot shorter than 40 years. As the Bible says, the Israelites, once they crossed the Red Sea, once Pharaoh was drowned, they now have this simple task, as it would appear, to move from the edge of the Red Sea to Canaan. We can do this. And the Bible says they move from place to place place to place. Life will take you from place to place. It will take you to, from camp to camp. It will take you day after day. And in these camps to Canaan, it represented seasons. Seasons that we all go through and seasons that we all have to respond to. Because how we respond in a certain season can determine our movement to the next season. How I respond in the current season that I'm in right now will determine my next season. Harsher the season, sometimes the movement decreases. In winter, how many of you want to just sit on your couch and put the fire on and get a blanket and watch TV for hours? How many of you then get up on the couch and go, oh, it's hard because in the harsher seasons, sometimes your movement decreases. But whatever season you are in, you have to maintain some level of movement within that season. That's why I always encourage my pastoral advice to people in church who are going through some hard stuff, challenging stuff, crazy stuff that you have to deal with. It's not downgrading and downplaying what you're going through, but one of the best things that you can do is keep some movement in you. I don't feel like going to church today, but I'm going to move to church. I don't feel like going to life group, if I'm honest, but I'm going to move to, why? Because I'm keeping some movement. Even the people with the worst physical conditions who can hardly walk are trained by physiotherapists to at least make some form of movement. It might only be three steps, but three steps is better than seizing up in there all day. You have to have some level of movement within you. And God will take you on a journey even after Pharaoh has been defeated, but we have to develop the attitude, the wisdom, and the maturity to get there. 
Because Pharaoh has been defeated. The enemy has been defeated. We haven't got time. He's been defeated. He's drowned. You're now free. But it wasn't the devil. The devil didn't stop the Israelites entering Canaan for 40 years. They stopped themselves. The devil can't take credit. (laughs) Pharaoh's gone. Pharaoh's been defeated. They stopped themselves. And they camped in places where God expected movement. Don't park up the car and put the handbrake on when the traffic light is green. (laughs) The traffic light is green because it is encouraging you, it is commanding you, it is ordering you to keep moving. Cars that slow down when the light is green, I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) When the light is green, speed up, don't slow down. And they camp through certain places in the final few minutes. Let me show you some of the places where they camped. They camped, and here I have my beautiful pop-up tent. Look at that. Look at that teeny tiny tent. They camped in places, and they set up camp in all of these places. One of the camps that they had in this 40-year journey was this camp of regret, where they just camped in a place of regret. And almost like, do you remember what life was like back there? I wish we hadn't done that. I wish we hadn't gone. I wish, I wish, I wish. We regret leaving Egypt now. And if we had known how this would be, we probably wouldn't have gone. But we're just this place in this camp of regret which says, you know, I should have years ago done this. This camp of regret that says, you know, I could have done this. Do not live in a should have world. It will keep your life in reverse where you say, I've missed my chance. (laughs) It's too late now. Why didn't I do this? But I have to renew my mind in the camp of regret and learn what needed to be learned and be, for great, and be grateful for what the future holds as God says, move on. <laughs> let's pack up our tent of regret and let's move on. We've got a place to go. And sometimes we have to stop. And they stopped in this 40 years, many places. And they stopped in the camp of comparison. And the com- camp of comparison was Egypt had better food than what we have. <laughs> Egypt, they had houses and We have tents and look how it compares. And we can so often spend our whole life comparing, not always with each other, but comparing season to season. Do you remember what it was like when we used to be there, what it used to be like when we were there? Compare, compare, compare. And Pharaoh has gone. Pharaoh has been defeated. You've already done the hard part. You've already moved on. But now the command from God is to keep moving on. On And the problem with comparison is that it keeps your eyes to the left or to the right. To the left or to the right. What's he doing? What's she doing? What are they doing? What are they buying? Where are they going? And you keep living to the left or to the right when the Bible is clear. We look forward. Because you cannot move forward looking left or looking right. You can, but you will end up crashing You will end up crashing if you do not move on forward as you look left and right. Young people, please do not set your lives up in camps of comparison, but move on. You then move on to the next place. What's the next place? Is this, we're we're a little bit nearer to Canaan. We're not there yet, but we're camping again. Should have taken two weeks, but it's 25 years now. We're in the camp of lack. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough provision. We're always short. You know, when I was a university student, for three years I lived in a camp of lack. I expected it. Looking back now, it was a wrong expectation. 
I had a friend who was at university, at Bible college with me after I finished university. And all the students at Bible college were expected to be poor. Do you know what? He was so wealthy as a Bible college student. He had a job which he did six hours a week and, and, and just was incredible in how he managed it and the gifts that God had given him. And it blew my mind because I just was camping in a season in a place of lack. And God says, you can move on. I can still move forward with limited resources. That in fact, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And if you keep camping in lack, if I keep living here, God is saying Canaan is there and there is an abundance of resource in Canaan. It is flowing. But if you just keep living here, if you keep camping here, you're not gonna get to experience what that land actually looks like. As the band come up and close with me this morning. The camp of lack and then we move a little bit and we go to the, the camp of negativity. And this camp is full of grumbling and full of complaining and the negativity spreads throughout the camp. In fact, it was this that cost them 40 years. But I have to move on from negativity and I have to move on to say with God all things are possible he's opened the sea he's fed us with manna from heaven he's done it before guess what he can do it again I move on from the camp of negativity and I'm getting closer but still there and I then find myself in the final camp the final camp simply says I'm just not sure we'll ever get there I'm just not sure my business will ever get there I'm just not sure my marriage, my debt will ever get there. So we settle and we seize up and we circle for 40 years in this wilderness. Unlike Caleb and Joshua, who look at the land and said, we should pick up our tents. We should go because you know what? We can certainly do this. And so I'm leaving my place of negativity. I'm leaving my place of lack. I'm leaving my place of limitation. I'm leaving, my, I'm leaving all of those camps of comparison. I'm leaving those camps and I'm taking them with me and I'm moving. I'm moving because I tell you what, if God says we can do it, we can do it. If God says He's given us this land, He's given us this land. So come on Israelites, come on Israelites. Are you with me? Are you going? Are we going? We can certainly do it. And this morning, let's pack away our camps and let's move on. Prophetic for some of you today. Pack away your camp and move. You might not enter Canaan tomorrow, but at least you're heading in the right direction. I might not enter Canaan next week, but I want to head towards Canaan. I want to head in the right direction. When Jesus calls His disciples, He simply says, come follow me and I will make you. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Was I a fisher of men the next week? Peter says, no, but three years later, I'm speaking and 3,000 people are being added to the kingdom. People are being baptized. Why? Because I've left that place and I've made a decision to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Hey, I'm so glad that we had this time together. And now we are praying that you get busy following Jesus, making a difference in your world. And we want to invite you, come visit us in one of our four campuses, Bradford, Leeds, Belfast, or Warsaw, Poland, and we would love to see you soon. What is in a word? Where can its meaning take us? If we were to live by a word, stand on a word, be at home in a word, what word would we choose? If I shout love, would all receive it? If I shout free, would all be it? If I speak life, would each grasp it? But what if I said one?
one word that overwhelms the many words, one shout that asks you to focus on me, listen to me, one that narrows the path from the many to say there is one way, one that says you are a part of something bigger, called to belong to something greater. For there is one name above every name, one love that is greater than any love, one whose word has power over every other word, one way, one savior, one. His name is Jesus. The one who gave his life for each one, the one who sacrificed it all so all could belong. The power of one calls for one voice, one hope and one truth. It asks you and I to lay aside what divides. It tells prejudice to die as one who shed his blood, uniting every tribe and every tongue. His one death gave all life and in doing so created one family called to build one kingdom with one enemy defeated, one army called to march for one cause. So come one and come all to the one who is over it all and through it all. It is time now to move as one, speak as one and act as one. We who are many are never more powerful than when we are one.